Good evening. America is facing a crisis over race, and we're right in the middle of it. Tonight, WKOW presents a documentary on the extreme racial disparities in Wisconsin. When we began working on this nearly a year ago, we knew we had a lot of material to cover. We had no idea, however, how much more would happen. From escalating racial unrest at the University of Wisconsin to a deadly rash of black-on-black -black shootings in Madison, to the violent arrest of a young African-American woman, to the racially motivated violence around the rest of the country, tensions over race are at their highest level since the civil rights era of the 1950s and 60s. Tonight, we hope to raise some questions, provide some context, and have a frank conversation about what we all must do to come together as one state, one nation of many races. Wisconsin, especially Dane County and Madison, take pride in their reputations for having a great quality of life. They routinely show up high on lists of the best places to live in America with low unemployment, good schools, and health care. But not everyone shares in that prosperity. And now it's threatening the state's future because Wisconsin has also earned the reputation as the worst place in the nation to live if you are black. This is All Wisconsin. I'm Greg Jeske. What you will see and hear in this program will probably make most of you uncomfortable. And by most, we mean the nearly 90% of Wisconsin's population that is white. Race and racism are not subjects many people want to talk about, but more unsettling than the discussion about race is the evidence that some say proves Wisconsin is one of the most racist states in the country. How, why, and what to do about it are what we'll examine here. And while no one person speaks for an entire race, we talk to about two dozen people, most of them longtime Dane County residents, most of them black, to help us all understand why our Wisconsin is not a place where everyone feels at home. Here, it's like you can't explain it. You just know that white people aren't comfortable with you. It's, the, it's their body language. They talk to you smiling, but their bodies turn sideways. The color of a person's skin often determines the quality of their life in the United States. Our society still struggles to include its black citizens without prejudice. If you don't rock the boat, you're a nice person of color. You're, 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 you're articulate, you're nice, you're friendly. If you push too hard, well, you're sounding like an angry black man, and that's divisive, and well, what good is that serving? In Wisconsin, the racism we're talking about isn't usually the in-your-face blatant hatred stereotypically associated with the Deep South. It's subtle, often silent, but ultimately more sinister. I didn't understand the racial implications of what it meant to be black until I moved to Madison. What are those implications? That I was a threat um, and that people thought I was here because uh, something was handed to me. Sociologists call them microaggressions, subtle but significant ways in which African Americans are made to feel like second class citizens. And those white attitudes are often shaped by ignorance and stereotypes. There's stores that I'll go in medicine and I'll be followed and I'll look behind and the person will turn their head quickly because they don't want to, you know, seem like they're following me, you know, and I'll walk around, you know, sometimes my kids will ask me, is somebody following me because they're very observant. I went to the grocery store, um, I had my associated bank card, it's green, well, lo and behold, the EBT state food stamp program has a green card also. So the um, cashier automatically assumed that I was paying with food stamps and not cash. Wrong assumptions based on skin color are also a big problem in schools. I've had times where I raised my hand in one of my honors class and they'd be like, yeah, you can go to the bathroom. I'm like, no, I was trying to answer that question you just did, you know. Be like, <laughs> That would be a microaggression. Yes. Does that whittle away at your confidence at all? No. It just makes me 10 times more on fire, like, mm. A lot of that stuff is subconscious, and it's really about the perception that has been laid out of the black man in America. From enslavement up until the 50s and 60s, and even today, but other black voices argue that history shows widespread racism in America is a thing of the past and say race is being used as an excuse. Yeah, I mean, people have hardships. Most of them in this day and age are self-inflicted. They're like poor lifestyle choices. 150 years later, we are still at the bottom? 
It has to make you wonder about the cultural aspect of this stuff. But a growing number of Americans believe racism is a significant problem in our country. 50% in 2015 compared to 33% five years before. And 6 in 10 Americans in the same Pew Research Center poll said the country needs to continue making changes to give blacks equal rights with whites. People could argue today that race is really not a factor in American society, but then how is it that you see people shooting unarmed black people. Ra there's a racial prison to what they see. If race is not a factor, why do we still have an achievement gap based on race? If race is not a factor, how come we have so much unemployment? Based on one unchangeable characteristic, skin color, the divide between how Wisconsinites are faring has grown to an alarming size. And while Milwaukee is home to an overwhelming majority of the state's underwhelming minority of African Americans, it's in Madison and Dane County where you'll find some of the greatest racial disparities in the nation. Madison known to be progressive, liberal, you know, equal up to all of that. But Madison has fooled itself into thinking that we don't really have these problems. Madison is a tell of two cities for the have and have nots. And for African Americans, it's unfortunate to say it's not a city where African Americans have always been treated the same or have received the same services. But it hasn't always been this way. 30 years ago, blacks in Wisconsin were doing better than the national average economically. Now they're doing worse, in many cases, far worse. These disparities start from the day African Americans are born and continue through their childhood and adult lives. From infant mortality to success in school to jobs and income to the number of people arrested and put in jail, black people in Wisconsin are far behind their white neighbors. I want them to be cognizant of the 900 pound gorilla in the room, which is race and economics and depravities. And that this country, while it stands for economics and opportunities for all, we're not delivering on those goods, and the police are complicit. The statistics also help explain the situation from the white point of view. With such an overwhelming racial majority, many Wisconsinites have never met a black person, let alone no one. So their exposure to African Americans is often what they see in the media, which is often a negative stereotype. Just because of my skin color, that means I have to be this definition of a stereotype that you have in your head. I don't think that it's intentional. I think that's just the way that we're programmed. We're all fed the same narrative. And the narrative is that uh, black folks are to be feared, um, Hispanic folks aren't supposed to be in our country, and white is right. But those things, Craig, wear at the very soul of our black community. And that's not, it just gets pawned off as dads don't want to take care of their kids, kids don't have any, um, discipline, moms are too busy shopping or watching television or talking loud on their cell phones in public and no one's taking responsibility. And it works both ways. Wisconsin is now suffering because of its racial reputation. The state is struggling to bring in and keep more skilled workers. And experts say a big reason is because minorities, especially black Americans, don't feel welcome here. But you incarcerate African Americans at twice the national average. I mean, over twice the national average. So if you were looking for ethnic uh, uh, um, talent for diversity, talent from diversity, uh, why would they come here? It's not just a black problem, it's a community problem. We want Madison to be the type of place where it's best for all. Madison is heralded as um, the, the best place uh, in the nation uh, uh, to live. But that can't just be for a segment of the population. Black leaders say the racial disparities here have been a growing problem for decades. This is not new to them. They say it began in the 1980s when money for social programs was cut drastically. Before that, Madison, especially the University of Wisconsin, was known as a place that championed civil rights and fostered freedom riders, white students who went to the southern states in the 1960s to help blacks register to vote and attend newly integrated schools. Today, black students at the UW say the racial climate on campus has taken a huge step backward. The spring of 2016 saw tensions reach a new level with several racist incidents and then the arrest of a black student for painting anti-racist graffiti. Students of color felt under attack by racists and unprotected by university officials. 
It inspired a growing protest movement, including a performance artist who mocks white student apathy at the UW when it comes to the elephant in the room, racism. That there is no place for me here. My ears have more volume than your silence. I can hear you wishing me gone, and you'll definitely notice me then, mm. the elephant. How could you look at me and not see a black person? That's, that's, that's crazy. The, the issue isn't that, that, that you should look at me and not see a black person. The issue is what difference does it make to you? Next, the differences between black and white that begin at birth. We're watching tonight's documentary with a group of concerned citizens and community leaders who have ideas on solutions to the racial disparities and how you can get involved. We'll hear their ideas coming up. To sit in this chair, you've got to have what it takes. Perseverance. A strong work ethic. The drive to dig deeper. It's a responsibility we take seriously. To be here when you need us. Because the news never stops. Good evening, I'm Greg Jeske. And I'm Amber Noggle. Right now with Strike Team. 27 News. We've got you covered. County Sheriff's Office confirmed 27 Can you see me? Because I feel like I'm invisible. Like if it weren't for the news, no one would think of this place. But here we have bright spirits and vivid dreams. If only the world could see. that the racial disparities in Wisconsin are among the worst in the nation came out a few years ago. But the African-American community in Dane County has been talking about warning of the inequities for decades. The black community basically doubled from 1980 to 1990. We started my nonprofit in 1992 because of racial disparities. This isn't new. Alex G is president of the Nehemiah Center for Urban Leadership Development and a Madison resident since 1970. When the black community began to grow, we said to, broader, to, to the broader community, we need more social workers, police officers, teachers, administrators. And I think the response was the good old lovable Madison response. We love everybody. We do everyone. We don't see color. And so we didn't respond. There had been other studies like the Urban League State of Black Madison in 2008 that revealed all the disparities that exist now. But ultimately, it took a white voice to get the attention of the white leaders about the problems facing the black community. In 2013, the Race to Equity report was released by the Wisconsin Council on Children and Families. A white um, group that was a not-for-profit group who work with Annie Casey Foundation money, which is a major grant funding opportunity from a federal level, when they actually highlighted our problems, then people began to say, ay, 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 there's a problem in Dane County. Tracing the birth of our racial disparities takes us to the alarming fact that they begin at birth for black people in Wisconsin. Over time, modern medicine has taken much of the risk out of childbirth, but in this state, the likelihood of a problem-free birth drops substantially when the baby and mother are black. In the United States, in terms of, say, infant mortality, um, African-American babies have twice the chance of dying compared to white babies. And that is true in our local Dane County as well. You also have a much higher increased chance of dying if you're an African-American mother compared to a white mother. According to CDC numbers for 2013, the infant mortality rate in Wisconsin, the number who die per 1,000 births, was just under five for whites compared to almost 17 for blacks. Nationally, those rates were about five for whites and 11 for blacks. The state's black infant mortality rate is second worst in the nation behind Kansas. Infant mortality is associated with low birth weight, and that's where uh, black babies are hit the hardest. Why black babies and black mothers die with much higher frequency than white babies and white mothers, it is multifactorial. 
Dr. Laurel Rice is the OBGYN chair at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health. Her department is on a mission to reduce the state's death rate for African-American babies and their mothers. She says those factors include the common things like income, education, and access to care, but she says one factor that's often left out by the traditional medical community is race. But I, I think, I think to ignore that as a component would be wrong. Okay. What part it plays is hard to say. Um, but the, the data is so stark. It's a horse's nose. Uh, yeah, you see that? You see that right here? I didn't even know that I was pregnant with twins. I thought I just had one baby in me until I went to the hospital and I'm like, you know, there's a lot going on here and they were like, you're having a miscarriage. After losing one twin five months into her pregnancy due to a misdiagnosed ultrasound, Victoria Frazier was focused on getting as much prenatal help as possible when she became pregnant again. Her doctor steered her toward a new pregnancy centering class with other mothers-to-be developed by Dr. Rice and her colleagues. It helped me out a lot because I wasn't so lonely. Like, I wasn't lonely because I had people around me, but like going through the pregnancy myself, you know, I had people to talk to, which was great because I had a lot of questions. 31 weeks, five days, right? Yeah. I do think the cornerstone of health disparities in general is education. In education, the right education, not like a handout where it's like, oh, is that the right? I mean, right level, the right content. Making it out of the womb and through their first year is just the first challenge for black babies. A 2014 Annie E. Casey Foundation study used 12 different factors like health, access to education, and home life to determine that Wisconsin ranks last in the nation in overall child well-being for African Americans. The study ranked the state in the top 10 for the well-being of white children. It would be impossible to not talk about this and mention the ideology behind white supremacy. What do you mean? Well, in the news today, I mean, if one reads the newspaper at all, there are episodes on a daily basis where it's obvious that African Americans um, are treated differently than whites. Health disparities follow African Americans through life, with higher death rates from heart disease, diabetes, and cancer, not to mention a lower life expectancy than whites, where, once again, Wisconsin has one of the biggest gaps in the nation. It's not just health, but health care, where black people in Wisconsin find themselves behind their white neighbors. A 2015 study by the Kaiser Family Foundation found blacks in Wisconsin are far less likely to have a usual source of health care and health insurance. So when you consolidate all of these reports, they're all coming up with the same problems. We are in trouble. And the trouble often starts with the struggle to make a living. It doesn't look like the cotton field anymore, but now it looks like private corporations. When it comes to the bottom line, Wisconsin is at or near the bottom for having the biggest economic disparities between whites and blacks. In our state, blacks are more than three times as likely as whites to be unemployed and about four times as likely to be living in poverty while earning about half as much in household income as whites, according to Census Bureau and Race to Equity reports. Economics, money, is what brought African Americans to this country in the first place, and it's what's kept many of them from being able to get ahead ever since. It goes back to slavery then. Yes. Uh, some people would say that's done and over with and, 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 and the country has moved way past that. Oh, I don't know if we can necessarily say that when you uh, subject a group of people to conditions of not being able, uh, afforded opportunities to learn how to read and write. But what happens to the folks that don't have those resources? We forget that white people through slavery and other um, methods of domination were able to build assets was able to pass it on generation to generation, whether it was a house, whether it was a trust fund. And that's perhaps the key to our racial disparities, the root of the opportunity gap for black Americans. They were not able to accumulate wealth like white Americans after World War II because something called the GI Bill, passed by Congress, kept many of them from being able to buy what economists say is the single most important asset for most families, a home government backed over a billion dollars to build homes, which was the boom of the suburbs and the middle class wealth. 
that was restricted for whites only. Blacks were not afforded those opportunities. After the Civil War, slavery was replaced by what's known as Jim Crow, rules that kept blacks segregated in second class, everything from water fountains and bathrooms to where they could live and go to school. Even though one million served in World War II, they were not given the opportunity to invest in their futures the way white veterans were. So in history, we understand that, that those things were created, some of them by our own government, and they were only limited to certain groups of people, that gives certain groups of people a head start. Doesn't make everyone bad or evil, but I think if people understood that academically, historically, this isn't just, you know, an angry black man's propaganda, that this is history, it's on the books. Not only did the 1944 GI Bill deny many black World War II veterans that crucial opportunity to buy a home, it also refused them business loans, admission to whites-only colleges, and job training programs. Fast forward to 2013, when the Pew Research Center found that the wealth of white households in the U.S. was 13 times the median wealth of black households. Seven decades since the GI Bill and black Americans are still living the legacy of their nation's institutional racism. It was the worst experience of our life. Andrina Tribble and her family found out in January of 2015 the panic of being suddenly homeless. When her husband became seriously ill, they couldn't pay their apartment rent and got evicted. We weren't able to find anything. So we were in our car and... Um, How many of you? Five. Eventually, the Tribbles got into a Madison motel that took homeless vouchers. Then Andrina, her husband, and three kids searched frantically for a new home. Like, oh, we'll be fine. We'll get a place within a month or so. You know what I mean? We'll be OK. And then one month turned into two months, and then three months. What little money the Tribbles had went to paying the balance of their motel bill. And soon, even that was gone. It was difficult, you know, like we, we lost our vehicle, you know, paying high hotel cost. We lost it when if we could have got stable sooner, we would have been able to keep it. And then there were nights we went without food, you know what I mean? Because you're paying for a hotel, we went without food. African Americans are by far the largest group in Dane County served by homeless shelters, according to the latest government report from 2013. It showed three quarters of the homeless families that year were black. Recent economic history has taken its own toll. The Great Recession still hasn't ended for many black Americans. Since 2012, average family wealth is down, more are living in poverty, more are unemployed or underemployed than when it began in 2008. Wisconsin is home to some of the nation's biggest racial disparities in income and employment. An African American man that does not have a degree, um, that did not graduate from high school, you can't come to Madison and hustle and get a job. There, there, you know, there, there's not a job where you can get a livable wage here. Former Madison police chief and ex-Urban League president Noble Ray says the racial disparities put many African Americans at a disadvantage the moment they arrive here. Sometimes we talk about the problem so much that the person that we're talking about or people that we're talking about they get stereotyped in that way. An example is 50% of uh, people who apply for jobs that have black names don't get callbacks because of the name. So if my name is Jamal, I apply for a job, and Darren applies for a job, and we have the same credentials, more than likely Jamal gets kicked to the side because Jamal is a black sounding name. The research is out there and real. Percy Brown Jr. teaches adult racial diversity classes and directs equity and student achievement in the Middleton School District. He points out there is also an economic price to pay for Wisconsin's reputation as the worst place in America for blacks to live, a worker shortage. You incarcerate African Americans at twice the national average. I mean, over twice the national average. So if you were looking for ethnic uh, uh, um, talent, for diversity, talent from diversity, uh, why would they come here? And now, almost by necessity, they're going to have to change their strategy because they're not going to get talent unless they look at the broad spectrum of people. And right now, we're the United States is 37% minority. 
Wisconsin's total minority population is less than 25 percent. Less than 7 percent are African American. There's another piece of history that factors into Wisconsin's economic racial disparities, the nation's welfare system. Some people argue that policies established in the 1960s war on poverty created a single parent welfare cycle in black families that still exists today. You couldn't get welfare benefits unless you were a single parent. If that parent was found living with a man, he didn't even have to be working. Well, for Ben, we're threatened to be taken away. It encouraged the lifestyle. And then it became generational. And so generations went by with many black families having only a mother as their stable parent. In 2014, the percentage of Wisconsin children living in single parent households was 25% for whites and 80% for African Americans. Now, compared to the national numbers, Wisconsin's were the same for white kids, but 14% higher for blacks. And the vast majority of those single parent families are led by women and far more likely to live in poverty. All the things that can seem obvious, that if you don't have someone helping you learn about that and you're a single mom with low resources, it's, it's just impossible. It's always hard for me to get a house when you um, don't have enough income to move into the apartment, they won't give you a chance. Lavana Jones was a single parent with three kids for most of 2015 after her husband was arrested and put in jail. So the police came and they arrested him and they were saying that he did like a domestic violence. So he went to jail for that. And so by, by him wasn't there to help me. So um, I, lost, I lost the home. No longer able to afford their house in Madison, Lavana and her three sons lived with family members who had the room and resources to share. What's it like to be looking at the end of the month and know that you're not going to have enough? Um, I really just pray about it. I just pray about it. And then my um, baby sister always asked me when my husband was incarcerated, then she me, do I need help? And I say, yeah. Sometimes I feel sad by um, asking her to help me, but she still helped me. And with her husband in the hospital, then recuperating at home from his illness, Andrina Tribble found herself functioning as the sole breadwinner for her family. Every day, I would get up and I would leave and I would go fill out applications. I would go to food pantries. I would do whatever I had to do. In Wisconsin, more than half of African-American children live in poverty, about twice the number of white kids. Again, one of the biggest gaps in the nation. And the effects of that toxic stress carry over into the classroom. We're missing these children, and then when we miss them, then all of a sudden they be get bored in class, and then, then they become a disruption, and then all of a sudden they start getting suspended and expelled, and, and, and it goes on and on. It's like a, it's like a snowball effect. <laughs> Take the ball from me. There you go, JoJo. There you go. Good job, good job, good job. Of all the extreme racial disparities in Wisconsin, perhaps none is more alarming, disturbing, or destructive as those involving African-American children. Education is often the only way people living in poverty can pull themselves out. But like the health disparities at birth and the poverty disparities at home, African-American children in Wisconsin face the nation's worst racial disparities at school. Focus on getting this done. Studies show many black students begin their educational careers behind and never catch up. Experts say the pressures of poverty can cause changes in the brain that can lead to issues with behavior and low performance in school. And according to the Census Bureau, almost 60% of Dane County's African American children live in poverty. Poverty does matter. It does matter if a kid slept in a car the night before in terms of their willingness and ability really to come to school and be focused on learning. The latest numbers follow a decades-long pattern. Wisconsin's graduation and test scores are among the best in the nation for white students. And the gap between their educational achievements and those of African-American students is the worst in the nation. If you have children in the same setting and their performances are so different, that means someplace, somewhere, the system has got to step up. In 1994, the Wisconsin Public Interest Research Group released a report describing a dual education in Madison schools. It's one of the first studies to conclude that there were deliberate, systematic ways in which race was a factor in the unbalanced success rates between black and white students. 
The report stated two main factors, high suspension rates for black students and a dramatic lack of African-American teachers. The black student-teacher ratio that year was 75 to 1, 11 to 1 for whites. In 2015, the black ratio was still 64 to 1, and two decades later, Madison schools still had the biggest racial achievement gap in the nation. That looks good. Here, start rewriting it in here. Okay. Kamara Stovall is one of the few African-American men teaching today in the Madison School District. In fact, it's rare to see a black teacher in most Madison schools. In the 2013-14 school year, black students made up 22% of MMSD enrollment, but only 2.2% of teachers were black. Children have to see themselves, you know, when they, when they come to school every day, if they see somebody that resembles their parents or whatnot, people that actually value their education, then they'll have more value in their education. Time is critical when it comes to teaching. Studies show that students who aren't reading at their age level by the third grade are far less likely to graduate, and two-thirds of those who aren't up to speed by the fourth grade will end up in prison or on welfare. They see us, and they see, well, maybe you don't have to end up in jail. Or maybe you don't have to, you know, stay at home. You know, may I see you every morning. I see you come to school with a smile on your face. You know, you don't have to always walk around angry or mad. You know, there, there are outlets, you know. But if you don't see it if, it, if you're not exposed to it, then there's no way of you to really know of what direction to go. I grew up in this community. I've only had two black teachers in my life, three of them. One art teacher, three in my entire life. Alex G. is a Madison West High and University of Wisconsin graduate and community leader who says the lack of black teachers can be traced back to the nation's school integration in the 1960s when black students first began attending previously white-only schools. When we were integrated into white schools, our black teachers, our heroes, were not allowed to come with us. And we have not recovered from that. And to this day, we are still begging for black teachers. But here's where the long-standing racial disparities in test scores, graduation, and college enrollment have become a vicious circle. It's going to be very, very difficult to increase the pool of black teachers if you don't increase the pool of students who graduate from high school and graduate from college. Former Milwaukee school superintendent and state employment relations secretary Howard Fuller says in the meantime, it's up to the current teaching core, overwhelmingly white in Wisconsin, to make a difference. But to do that, experts say many will have to change their attitudes that have been ingrained over the years, like the stereotype of black students who can't or won't learn. You have to make clear to them that I, I understand some of what you're dealing with. I don't understand all of it. But I'm going to do everything that I can to make sure that you learn. And I believe that you have the ability to learn. And I'm going to try to figure out different ways that I can teach you using the assets that you bring to the table. Racism in the education system isn't just about who is teaching, but also what they're teaching that African-American leaders say needs to change if we hope to see better racial and cultural understandings in future generations. I learned in school that people who looked like me had chains around their necks. In second grade, my mother said, Alex, I remember when you came home, you said, Mom, were we slaves? And the only thing that the white kids learned was they set us free. So you're starting our kids' education, black and white and everybody else, with the perception that blacks were enslaved and less than. And then there's no mention of any great contributions of what blacks have done in America. And even when black students beat the odds and succeed in Wisconsin classrooms, the negative stereotypes still precede them. Well, I've had times where I raised my hand in one of my honors classes, and they'd be like, yeah, you can go to the bathroom. I'm like, no, I was trying to answer that question. You just did, you know, be like. <laughs> You can start talking about how we have a better schooling system. And as they represent their race in white-led classes, successful African-American students sometimes have to defend themselves against peers who say they're not black enough. I've had friends who told me that when I get in class, I act white. And I was like, explain to me what that means. It's always you're not black enough. Or you're... You're white. I've heard that before. Oh, yeah. So you act white. You're the whitest you black white. kid I know. I'm like, what? <laughs> There's a lot of isolation from, um, from African-American students who are doing well. Um, they're going up against a lot of um, uh, assumptions about their abilities, 
a lot of questions about what they want to do, a lot of pushback at time about some of their aspirations. A new study suggests that low expectations from teachers might generate low performance from students, which leads to lower test scores and lower graduation rates, which can then lead to even lower expectations. But there is also agreement that the schools are only part of the problem. Schools alone cannot address um, something this complex, right? You know, there's, there, there's a reason that homework is provided. I mean, there, there's an expectation that the, the, the learning extends into the home and to the community and that parents and family plays a role. Dr. Gerlando Jackson of the UW's Wisconsin Equity and Inclusion Lab says studies show blacks with equal education find fewer jobs and lower pay on average than whites. Wisconsin's racial education gaps in achievement and graduation are also a byproduct of how schools discipline their students. A 2015 UCLA study found our state's high schools had the highest black student suspension rate in the country and elementary schools the second highest. That means the students who are struggling the most in the classroom are being kept out of the classroom the most. And things have gotten worse over time. The 1994 WPRI study showed 50% of black students in Madison schools had been suspended. 20 years later, it was 64%, even though African Americans made up just 18% of the student body. Wisconsin also struggles with extreme racial disparities at the college level, and it's another example of history repeating itself. In 1969, thousands of students protested at the University of Wisconsin's black student strike, demanding better treatment of black students and more administration attention to racism on campus. Forty-seven years later, UW students walked out of some of those same classrooms in protest of the same things. It starts with diversity. Only about 2% of the student body is black. When we do get people here to, at the university, it is such a white place that they don't want to stay. Ask the white parents, would you send your kids to a college where there were one of three white students in a lecture hall of 600 black students? But it went beyond numbers in the 2015-16 school year, which was marred by several racist incidents at UW-Madison. Minority students complained that UW officials didn't do enough to stop it. Then it all boiled over in the spring when University of Police executed a rare classroom interruption to arrest a black student who was accused of painting anti-racist graffiti on campus. The chancellor and police chief apologized and later announced that the entire UW executive team would take cultural sensitivity and bias training. African-American students and leaders say the UW arrest was just another example of how blacks are unfairly treated by police. It is disheartening and I'm ashamed to be a student at UW-Madison and I often don't feel welcome here. Wisconsin's extreme racial disparities in the criminal justice system next. We're watching tonight's documentary with a group of concerned citizens like yourselves who have some ideas on solutions to the racial disparities we're talking about. We'll get their ideas coming up. Every year, tens of thousands of young people experience homelessness. I just remembered it's election day. Are you going to vote? I don't know. I don't think I'll have time today. Millions of eligible voters in America never make it to the polls or even register to vote. When you don't vote, you're letting other people make decisions for you and pick the things your taxes will pay for. Voting is more than a civic duty. It gives you a voice about the priorities and the future of your community and our nation. Register to vote today. Voting gives you a seat at the table. To understand the relationship between police and black Americans, we need to remember our country's history, which shows a level of suspicion, confrontation, and often brutality that goes back to slavery, Jim Crow, and the Civil Rights Movement. 
who never could trust those state troopers. Percy Brown Sr. grew up in Mississippi at a time when blacks feared white law enforcers as much, if not more, than the lawbreakers. Because many times the state trooper would pick you up, put you in jail, and bring in people and beat you up and kill you while you in jail or hang you and say, oh, he committed, you know, he committed suicide. Two decades later, on the other side of the civil rights movement and the other side of the nation, Noble Ray had a similar view of police growing up in Milwaukee. When I grew up in that environment, uh, I, I did not like police, okay? Uh, you know, I did spell police, and I've said, said this before, P-I-G. That's, that's the way I spelled police. We didn't look to police officers back then as someone that could help. The racial disparity group met. Now, 40 years after that, Madison Area High School student Anthony Gatlin finds himself in a reality that makes him wary of police. Sometimes I, I really don't feel safe walking outside at night um, just due to the fact of everything that's happened, even in our own community with Tony Robinson. Mm -hmm. Like that, that really hit me because I, that could have been me. A teenager, a man in his 50s, a man in his 70s. Different generations, different upbringings, but each with a shared experience and perspective. Being a black male in America. And in Wisconsin, it's a perspective often shaped through the bars of a jail cell. Incarceration and arrests are two more areas where our state's racial disparities are among the worst in the nation. And it starts with children. According to FBI and census data, Wisconsin has the second highest overall juvenile arrest rate in the country, behind only Indiana. But here, black kids are almost four times as likely to be arrested as white kids. That jumps to six times as likely in Dane County and eight times as likely in the city of Madison. It's so like my parents always tell me, like, behave yourself before I leave, like, before I leave the house. Because they have to make sure I don't present myself in a way that might get me in trouble with the police. I always make sure, like, when I step outside, I look presentable. So usually when it's dark, try not to wear my hood up or wear any dark clothing. Being black is constantly having to be on. Um, it's constantly having to be aware of your surroundings to, to watch how you talk or how you walk. The statistics show it doesn't get any better when African-American kids grow up. A study by the Center on Wisconsin Strategy found the state has the nation's highest rate of incarcerating African-American men and the second highest rate of arresting them. And Dane County's numbers are particularly high. White arrest and incarceration numbers are at or below the national rates. Critics call it proof of racial profiling by police. It's like you're almost, you're targeted, you know what I mean? or I've had instances where I've gone to the store to buy stuff and I've been followed and harassed like I was stealing something. Madison Police Chief Mike Koval insists his department does not target African Americans and says most arrests come from responding to 911 dispatch calls. But he also admits something is wrong when more than half the Dane County jail population is black in a community where they're outnumbered by whites 11 to 1. <laughs> Critics point to legal policies loaded with prejudice. For example, America's war on drugs that began in the 1980s was very racially biased. Laws carried much stiffer penalties for the drugs and offenses most commonly associated with African Americans, which led to skyrocketing incarceration disparities. Today, critics of the criminal justice system say many blacks end up behind bars because they can't afford to get out. They're in there for crimes really that most of us would frame as crimes of poverty, crimes that you commit because you're poor, you're desperate, you're hungry, you're homeless, you got tickets, suspended, child support, things that are a result of your inability to pay. And with more than half of Madison's African-American families living in poverty, even one run-in with the law can have profound consequences. Once you're in a criminal justice system, it's like a vacuum cleaner. You are sucked in and it impacts your housing, um, you know, your housing references and it packs you getting a job. Many of the individuals that we end up uh, with in my jail, and I got about a thousand beds in there, now they're unemployed. And in Milwaukee, where black unemployment and incarceration are at or near the highest in the nation, the county sheriff acknowledges the economic reality but accuses many of using it as an excuse. That's why we got so many people locked up in prison. They've all gone through due process. I don't want to hear about, well, they don't get the best lawyers. That's why you shouldn't get in trouble. 
You cannot ignore the poverty, the economics associated with it. If you've got money, if you've got means, you see the criminal justice system in a different way. You've got an attorney. You've got, um, you know, when you're presented in court, you can pay for a psychiatrist. You can pay for those things. So you look different as you are presented uh, in, in court. Noble Ray was there when the extreme racial disparities in the criminal justice system here were first revealed in 1993. So there's the story after story, report after report, and we, we don't seem to really get at resolving this. And I'm not backing away from some people need to be arrested, some people need to be incarcerated, but what we have failed to do from, from a criminal justice standpoint is really come up, in my view, with real-time alternatives. Ray is talking about alternatives to deal with juveniles, people with mental health issues, and those who have drug and alcohol problems. Because without those type of options, police often have no choice but to take people to jail. But for some in the African-American community, the arrest and incarceration rates are overshadowed by a more urgent issue, police use of force. You were wrong to shoot him. On March 6, 2015, Madison joined the list of American cities where a white policeman shot and killed an unarmed black man. Officer Matt Kenny and 19-year-old Tony Robinson met in a narrow stairway to a second-floor apartment. State investigators cleared Kenny of any wrongdoing, but the report left out what many see as the underlying cause of the tragedy, racial bias. Police have... Um, uh, this assumption of uh, moral authority, and, and, and as if that moral authority has no limits. Uh, and and uh, that's something that uh, police training and other things, you know, have to address, um, that every citizen um, deserves to be treated with dignity. And police have to, have to protect themselves, and every, nobody would disagree. But there has to be dignity in how you render public service. <laughs> As the nation held its breath, expecting violent protests that never came, many in Madison's small African-American community felt under siege by police. Parents feared for their children's safety outside the home. Especially after the Tony Robinson incident, me and her, we talked about it. She's, she always tells me, you know, watch, watch yourself at night, please. Tony Robinson was sort of the proverbial straw that tilted the balance and broke our collective backs in the sense that I think there was a collective gasp of frustration. This was the visible um, breakdown, if you will, in the criminal justice context in many people's minds. The Tony Robinson shooting was especially difficult for black officers. They were accused by some in the African-American community of turning their backs on their race. Others were reminded of their own run-ins with racism on the job when their skin color meant more than their uniform and badge. As a young police officer, um, I, I, was, I was called names, the, the N-word, in and, 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 and many ways. But, you know, as, as a chief of police, whenever there was a high-profile incident, it was not uncommon for people that would send an email uh, that would relate it back to race. Even as, a, even as a chief of police, it, it, that, that was not uncommon. As we left the bar, we turned to the squad car. Somebody, because uh, our backs are to the, the place that we were at, but somebody looked out the door and, and yelled, nigger. Okay, I'm a uniform officer. Um, I wasn't wounded by it. It struck me as, that's pretty bold. I have arrest authority. I have, you know... Uh, but that somebody would feel the liberty to do that. Who gave you drugs? Not the police! In the wake of the Tony Robinson shooting, Madison police of all races found themselves faced with trying to rebuild the public trust. So I think they really want to redefine and capture sort of that trust that we thought we had, and now we know we have to work more diligently to recoup. But for many, any repaired trust was shattered in mid-June when two white MPD officers arrested a black woman accused of creating a disturbance at Easttown Mall. One officer kicked, punched, and tased the unarmed 18-year-old Janelle Laird. Chief Koval and the head of the police union defended the arresting officers. But this time, the mayor called for a review of MPD policies and practices, including the use of force. Just because something is lawful 
it may still be unjust. Just because something is lawful does not mean it's right. Several gunshots were fired. At least one of them hit a man here behind the gas station. You can see the yellow police tape here behind us. It's usually not police on the other end of the gun. There is often a violent reality that goes along with being black, male, and poor in America. If I'm a young African-American male and I'm in a, a neighborhood that is more violent than what, what's around me, I know that I have to develop my justice, okay? I know that at times I have to uh, appear to be uh, 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 more uh, aggressive at times than I, than I should because that's how I survive. But sometimes the challenge can be to survive the aggressions of others. In the spring of 2016, three black men from Madison were murdered in a running dispute between two groups of friends. African-American leaders say the killings were, in part, the result of racial disparities that leave black men with few job opportunities and the dangerous attitude that they have nothing left to lose. I hope that the public, that our residents will come together and recognize the dire importance of young men being able to see a life for themselves here, being able to live in, an in a city where they feel um, that they can thrive, that there's opportunities for mentorship, for jobs, for success. The years of disparities may have created a problem that seems unsolvable, but there's a sense that now is the perfect time to change that. This isn't gonna be pleasant, but you must stay present and understand the importance of communication. Remember, we said this was going to make many of you uncomfortable, but African-Americans say they can take no comfort in a community where they often feel as though they don't have a seat at the community table. If you're not willing to acknowledge that there's a problem, then the healing process can never begin. So let's acknowledge, as a city, as a community, that, man, we have a problem, and it's called white supremacy, it's called white privilege, it's called white entitlement, it's called racism. The words are not easy to hear, but many black Americans say softening the language disguises the hard reality. Unfair disadvantages based on skin color make Wisconsin the worst state for black Americans to live. Everybody has to accept what has happened, what is happening, and we have to come together to figure out a new plan of what, we, what we're going to do. You know, there has to be lines drawn in the sand, things that are acceptable, things that are not. We have to continue to talk about race. But, but, but again, I, I, I'll say the struggle is to understand how it manifests itself today as distinct from other times. Today's racism is often more subtle, but no less harmful than it was decades ago. And that can make it harder to change. Change isn't easy, but we have to do something different or our disparities is going to get worse. Dane County Supervisor Sheila Stubbs, the only African-American on the 37-member county board, says the racial disparity reports and the national focus on the problems here have created a rare opportunity for local leaders to overcome a long-time criticism. They talk too much and act too little. I don't want to come out to another meeting to be a kumbaya hour. And I keep saying that because that's what people say to me. It's like, let's hold our hands, let's talk about it. What's an action plan? The county spends money on phosphorus and carp. Let's spend money on racial equity. What we do, our cycle here is a report comes out, we start treading water, and then we stop. We don't have that constancy of purpose where uh, someone is saying, we're measuring this, we're, we're gonna make a difference, we're gonna make a change. And black leaders say that's the key, accountability. They point to lots of past planning, but few results when it comes to ending racial unfairness in Wisconsin. This challenge did not happen overnight. So there's no solution that's gonna resolve it overnight. And then the key is the accountability. If there's no accountability, then the plan will be meaningless. And while he may not speak for most African Americans, the Milwaukee County Sheriff isn't alone when he says accountability starts at home. The greatest value we can instill in human beings is the ability to overcome obstacles. Because life's full of them. It has it, it may be race, it may, but it's, it, it's going to be a lot of things. You don't have enough education. You have, so when you say life, 
you know, they don't all, people all start out the same spot at the, I understand that. That's called life. We don't all get to start at the front of the starting line. But others argue that black Americans can only do so much when so many of the systems are biased against them. And I think with the African-American community, yeah, we can hold ourselves accountable, but guess who's writing the policy? Most likely it's not a person of color. Madison's racial situation has also created what black leaders see as a stereotypical mindset among white-run institutions, government, the university, of telling the black community what to do instead of working with it to solve problems. Call it a disparity of understanding. I feel that many of the conversations center around people trying to prove how open-minded they are. The thing with many of my liberal friends, they always thought that they had the answer. You know, because they say, oh, I'm liberal, I know more about this problem than, than, than you know. People think they, they know, right? They think they know the answer, but they don't have the proper analysis. And they don't have the right people sitting at that table, which are the folks who are impacted by policies and programs. The national scrutiny on the statistics, combined with evidence that Wisconsin's economy is suffering, gives black leaders hope that now is the prime time for Wisconsin, Dane County, Madison, to make meaningful changes in racial equity changes to help black families become financially stable. The father and mother have a job where they can be providers. Not a job making $5 an hour, $8 an hour, less than the minimum wage, but jobs that allow them to sustain a family. A job that allows them to provide the children uh, with the supports that they need to do well in school. Changes that result in more African Americans graduating high school and college. Kids have to be able to self-actualize and see themselves. And if they're not seeing it among staff in our schools and then they don't see it in their textbooks, those are barriers. Those are the unseen barriers that blacks have to deal with when they come through our educational system. Changes to bring fairness to our criminal justice system. Do we need to continue labeling kids at 17? If I could even push it up to 18, 18 and get some of these kids out of high school where those attractive nuisances occur, that would be infinitely better than starting kids. At, I think at 17, they should still be in the juvenile code. Leaders in the black community say money for new programs is crucial, but ultimately only part of the solution to the racial disparities. I think what we need are allies. I mean, the reason why we're doing this is because we need our white counterparts to do more than just volunteer and tutor with black kids. We need them to become allies and teach their white kids about how to dismantle systems of, of disparity, how do you speak up when something's wrong, and how do we become a part of the solution? They have to feel, they have to believe that this circumstance, this situation needs to change, and they have to see it not only from it's a righteous thing to do, but they need to see it also that it operates in their self-interest. That's why you need to see people, African Americans, young people, as assets, future assets for this community. How Wisconsin decides to move ahead on racial disparities may have a huge impact on its future and whether it can become one of the best places in America to live, regardless of the color of your skin. People around the world, but especially in Madison, are basically good and they want to be altruistic and inclusive. And in that sense, I think that there is a common denominator in understanding and respecting the benefits of everyone enjoying human respect, human dignity, and the opportunities to whatever American dream we all hold dear and cherish. We've got all the makings of being the world-class community we want to be if we put more energy into doing it rather than just talking about it. It's sad, tragic really, that it has taken such an eruption of violence to push these problems into the national and local conversations. But as we just heard, there is hope that now is the real time for some solutions, real solutions. And we've got more than two dozen people with us in our studio right now who have agreed to share their knowledge and their opinions with us. So let us first start with uh, one of the authors of the report that we relied so much on, Erica Nelson, if you don't mind standing up, is uh, with the Wisconsin Center for Children and Families. And basically put together the Race to Equity report in 2013. With the Race to Equity report and the data, I think the thing that doesn't get discussed is that everything is actually interrelated and connected, and it's not actually in a silo. So African-American babies aren't just like dying because they're African-American necessarily. It's because of all the stresses of all the other factors. So the criminal justice system and the reforms within the criminal justice system are related to employment, are related to housing, transportation, 
all of these aspects that we're talking about, the school systems, secondary education, how people feel about their college experience, their elementary educational experience, their community, their relations, it's all interrelated and inextricably linked to each other, and therefore, that's why we have the numbers that we have, because it's the reflection of all these things interacting. And I think that when we talk about all the people that are in the room and all these different facets who are, are being intentional about how to go forward, it's that continued level of intentionality, knowing that my accountability is attached to someone else's accountability to my right and to my left. One of the issues, of course, that has pushed this into the national conversation 